on this Monday night, ramping up the response to the COVID-19 outbreak. We are in uncharted territory. The steps Canada is taking as the outbreak grows and the U.S. records new deaths. A draft deal for the Wet'suwet'en people of British Columbia. The only way that we can make Canada a better country is if we do it together. What it could mean for future oil and gas projects. Plus, the desperate attempts migrants are again making to try to reach Europe. And we're streaming live now, the new way to get global news on a device near you. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the outbreak of COVID-19 and what you need to know about its spread. The numbers keep changing and so does the advice about travel. With March break around the corner, we know many Canadians are wondering about their plans. Here's where things stand right now. Canadians are being advised to avoid all non-essential travel to parts of northern Italy. That includes Venice and Milan. That same strict warning is in place for all of China and all of Iran plus two cities in the southeast of South Korea where outbreaks have occurred. Canadians are being told to exercise a high degree of caution in other parts of South Korea and in Japan. And starting today, anyone who arrives in Canada from Iran is being asked to self-isolate and monitor themselves for symptoms. The World Health Organization says there are now nine times more new cases outside China than inside China. The virus has been detected in more than 60 countries, including Senegal, Tunisia, Jordan and Iceland. Though it's important to note, many of those countries have only one or two cases. Interrupting the spread is the goal of public health experts. Some infectious disease specialists say that's no longer possible because it appears the virus can be spread by people who have no symptoms. But the World Health Organization is urging countries to put containment measures in place. We are still hopeful that containment is the, the right first strategy. But clearly, containment with the purpose of slowing down the virus. And if we're lucky and if we do the job really well, we may get the opportunity. We just might get the opportunity to interrupt transmission. Here in Canada, there are now 27 confirmed cases after three more positive tests in Ontario. All the Canadian cases are believed to be linked to travel. There's still no evidence of community transmission. But in the U.S., that is no longer the case. People appear to be contracting the virus in the community from people who have not traveled to country where there's an outbreak. In Washington state, that's just across the border from B.C., six people have now died. And authorities are preparing for that number to rise because it's believed the virus may have been circulating there undetected for weeks. Abigail Beeman has tonight's top story. A germ minimizing elbow bump greeting as health officials across the U.S. focus on reducing the spread of the new coronavirus. It's spreading to new states with the first cases in Rhode Island, Florida. The first patient's an adult resident in Manatee County without travel history to China or other countries identified for restricted travel by the CDC. And New York. Uh, we are fully coordinated. We are fully mobilized. New York's governor stresses the key is reducing the spread. Elimination is impossible. Andrew Cuomo promising new bleach cleaning protocols in schools and on public transportation and more than 1,000 devoted hospital beds. We want 1,000 tests per day. Uh, test as many as you can and then isolate those people. Federal officials are promising more test kits, everyone bracing for a further spike in cases, in part because of increased testing. And nationally, the spotlight is really on Washington state with at least half a dozen deaths and an increase in cases at this nursing home. The risk for all of us of becoming infected will be increasing. And although most of the cases will be mild or moderate, the infection can cause serious illness, and there's a potential for many people to become ill at the same time. In Texas, there's frustration with federal authorities after a woman who traveled there from Wuhan, China, was released from quarantine after testing negative twice and then brought back into isolation after a third test came back positive. We simply cannot have a screw-up like this from our federal partners. Um, I know you? that my husband's testing this morning, so we're praying for a negative tonight. These women are leaving quarantine in Nebraska, but leaving their husbands behind for now. The men tested positive after being aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which docked in Japan. This pair now has new fears about going home. Will my friends shun me when we go back? Or just the 
the community in particular, will they shun us, be afraid of us? With the new coronavirus increasingly on everyone's minds as it continues to spread. This afternoon, U.S. President Donald Trump and his coronavirus task force met with pharmaceutical executives. The president saying everyone's goal is to accelerate the development of a coronavirus vaccine. He also said he's eyeing new travel restrictions, but didn't offer any details. Donna? Okay, Abigail Beeman in Washington, thank you. Public health officials in Canada say the risk here is still low, and the only confirmed cases here are travel-related. That almost certainly, though, will change. Experts in infectious disease say the window is closing on what needs to happen to ensure our health care system can cope. And that includes precautions to keep frontline health care workers safe and increased surveillance and testing instead of waiting for people to show up at emergency rooms. About 2,900 people in Canada have been tested so far. Robin Gill looks at how Canada's public health response is being stepped up. In the Greater Toronto Area, the Transit Authority is trying to find passengers who may have travelled with a 34-year-old woman recently diagnosed with the new coronavirus after arriving from Iran. The fear? COVID-19 spreading at the community level. We're cooperating fully with the uh, public health authorities to help them uh, trace the customers on that train and uh, get, get information to them. Canada has a pandemic plan that was implemented post-SARS and tested in 2009 during the H1N1 epidemic. It involves a command centre with health experts to guide hospitals in case of a mass health scare. You always want to have these things in place before there's the need and that you're planning for that and prepared for that. Canada's top doctor says there's a new surveillance system in place since the appearance of COVID-19 in this country. So these are people who are, um, have certain symptoms, like flu-like symptoms, um, and it's adding the COVID-19 test to those kind of testing. Anyone showing symptoms is being advised to call public health authorities before showing up at hospitals. But there's no way to monitor that. And here's why that's troubling. This is a virus that can be transmitted when people have very mild symptoms. People may not know to present. Uh, and so it is quite possible that those containment measures will not uh, work in the long run. It's kind of perfectly prepared. Difficult to say. Dr. Sunivas Murthy is working with the World Health Organization to track COVID-19. Making sure hospitals are adequately staffed, making sure people know where to seek care if they need to at the public level, making sure all the supply chains are readily checked, namely masks and gloves and other personal protective equipment. There's a run on stocks of cleaning supplies and sanitizers in case this turns into a worse outbreak. For the most part, though, Canadians are remaining calm. Trying to not uh, buy into the uh, hysteria that's going on. But it could be a matter of time before the disease isn't just one brought in through travel. It's not improbable that more cases will be happening here, even at the community level. And health professionals say that will be the next front in the battle against this virus. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. Other countries like the UK are preparing for the number of cases to rise significantly and are ramping up their preparations. There are 39 confirmed cases in the UK now, but public health officials there say widespread transmission is highly likely. The Prime Minister held an emergency meeting about COVID-19 today, and the European Union has raised the risk from moderate to high. As Crystal Gamansing reports, everyone is watching what's happening in Italy, Iran and South Korea. It is a mammoth task, sanitizing a mall with the hope of keeping people in Seoul healthy. The number of people infected with COVID-19 in South Korea has climbed past 4,000, the highest count outside of China. People are fearful of the disease and suspicious of those around them. This 20-year-old student says maybe the person is my neighbor or passed me by. This is highly contagious, so I don't know what to do. I'm worried about going outside. Many of the infections are in the southeast and transmission can be linked back to members of a secretive religious sect. City officials are asking prosecutors to file homicide and other charges against members of the sect. Monday, the leader begged for forgiveness on his knees. Members did not initially disclose they had been traveling to Wuhan, China. The founder says, I'm really grateful that the government has been making efforts to stop the coronavirus spread, and at the same time, I'm asking for forgiveness. 
In Israel, this is what voting day looks like in the middle of a global epidemic. Officials took precautions so that residents in a quarantine neighborhood could still cast a ballot. This is a democracy. The corona thing is completely under control. Today, we're, we've taken all the precautions that are necessary. People can go and vote with complete confidence. But there is no complete confidence. A team from the World Health Organization has landed in Iran with additional supplies. But a team member on the ground is already infected with COVID-19. And an advisor to Iran's supreme leader has died of the virus. Italy, meanwhile, saw a huge spike in infections and deaths. Areas in the north are the heart of Europe's worst outbreak of the disease. A government-issued quarantine is still in place for some 50,000 people in 11 towns. A student in northern England who traveled to Italy is the latest person to be infected. A number of schools have closed as a result. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says likely the situation here will get worse, but says people should trust in the health care system. Donna? Okay, Crystal Gamancing in London, thanks. Breaking new ground in northern B.C. Coming up, a tentative agreement on land rights and title for the Wet'suwet'en. Though it doesn't mean those rail blockades are all coming down. Construction on the coastal gas link pipeline is underway again in northern British Columbia. It's the natural gas pipeline running through Wet'suwet'en territory that's caused so much tension. Work was paused over the last few days while negotiations took place. And yesterday, there was a breakthrough. A draft agreement has been reached on land rights and title for the Wet'suwet'en. But it's a separate matter from the natural gas pipeline project. Sarah McDonald is at the work site near Houston, B.C. Sarah? Donna, work has now resumed in northern B.C. on the heels of that proposed landmark agreement that could have major implications for this province and the country. With work and RCMP patrols now resuming on the indigenous land at the epicenter of national dialogue on rights and title. The respect has to, has to go right from top to bottom and throughout the country. It remains to be seen what impact, if any, a potentially precedent-setting draft agreement reached between government officials and one faction of leadership of Wet'suwet'en Nation could have on unrest persisting across the country. Because these talks were about much more than just a solitary polarized pipeline and more than two decades in the making. It is building on the Supreme Court decision. It is, uh, it is about rights and title. A continuation of negotiations called for in a landmark Supreme Court ruling, only now coming to fruition. Delgamuk 1997 has been sitting there for the past 23 years or so. We are just picking it up. If it is finalized, that agreement could have major implications for companies looking for access to indigenous land and resources, but it's not retroactive. And it won't directly impact the lucrative project dividing this powerful nation. The project that's in place now, the, the permits have been in place. The, it has been permitted, it has been approved, and it's underway. This natural gas pipeline, fully permitted and backed by government and band councils and many Wet'suwet'en people. People just want to work. Our community wants to work. And I think the benefits are going to be really important to our people. Who now hold the power when it comes to signing on the dotted line. The nation's clans will now review the details of that draft deal in the coming days and weeks before coming to a consensus on it. The provincial and federal governments said to be ready and willing to sign it, so long as the Wet'suwet'en people are. Donna. All right, Sarah McDonald near Houston, B.C. Thank you. That potential deal in northern B.C. has not brought down all the rail blockades. In fact, the opposite happened today, at least temporarily. A new blockade went up along a commuter rail line this afternoon in Montreal. Our Mike Armstrong is there. Mike, what happened? Well, we got a press release uh, sort of mid-afternoon saying that there was a blockade at this overpass behind me. And sure enough, we found when we got here about 40 protesters on the overpass, as well as about uh, a dozen police officers, police cars. Uh, now, this was not an Indigenous group. This was a, a group that says it was inspired by Indigenous resistance. They were here about uh, for about three hours. They blocked both freight and commuter lines. Now, they acknowledge that there was a tentative deal over the weekend in B.C., but they say there's still no agreement on the coastal gas pipeline and 
that's why they were here. The demonstrators left after talking to police at about uh, five o'clock. So they were here for about uh, three hours. Now, the Ganawagi rail blockade continues on the south shore of Montreal. That's 22 days and counting. There is a meeting tonight at the Longhouse in that community. Everyone from the community has been invited there. The question is whether they take it down or not. But to answer that question, they have to decide whether the progress that was made is enough or whether they have to have a resolution before they pull it down. Donna? All right, Mike Armstrong, thanks. Still ahead, thousands on the move as migrants move between Turkey and Greece. You're watching Global National. Tens of thousands of lives are on the line tonight as Greece and Turkey argue over a new surge of migrants trying to get to Europe. Greece is refusing to accept any more asylum applications, and a child drowned when a dinghy filled with 48 migrants capsized off the Greece, Greek island of Lesbos. It's the first reported fatality since Turkey eased restrictions at its border last week. Turkey is now allowing people to leave, saying it can no longer afford to support the millions of refugees who have fled there because of the war in Syria. Greece is telling them to turn back, and police are using tear gas, stun grenades, and rubber bullets at land borders to disperse them. All of this is raising fears thousands more lives could be lost, and a new migrant crisis could emerge in Europe. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is leading but not winning after the third general election in less than a year. Voter turnout hit a 20-year high. Exit polls show Netanyahu's Likud party may again be just shy of a majority. Netanyahu, is the, who is the longest-serving prime minister in Israeli history, is facing a stiff challenge from retired military chief Benny Gantz and his Blue and White Party. Neither leader was able to form a government after elections last April and in September. They failed to make deals with smaller parties to secure a majority. Netanyahu is seeking re-election under the weight of a corruption trial that's due to start in two weeks. He has denied any wrongdoing. Jack Welch, who led the company General Electric through two decades of extraordinary prosperity, has died. Welch became one of the most successful leaders in the U.S. During the 80s and 90s, he was GE's chairman and chief executive, and he grew the company from a maker of appliances and light bulbs into an industrial and financial services powerhouse. He was named Manager of the Century by Fortune magazine in 1999 after General Electric's revenue jumped nearly fivefold during his tenure. He was also criticized, though, for slashing GE's workforce, earning him the nickname Neutron Jack. His wife says he died of renal failure. He was 84 years old. Next, a new approach to bringing you the news you need. The way we get our news has changed far beyond what I could have imagined back when I got started in this business and was writing up stories on a manual typewriter. Yep, that's how old I am. The options now are just too many to count. We come to expect news and just about all programming to be available whenever we need it and want it. And as Mike Drolet reports, Canada's first streaming service for news and entertainment has just been launched. We live in an era of choice. Everywhere we look, there's a screen. Don't like it? Look somewhere else. Technology, for all the wonder it offers, has given us a sense of liberating confusion. How many hours a day do you think you're connected? Uh, at, least, at least 12, probably more than a full-time job. Sometimes, you know, I'm up all night, like I barely get some sleep, get like four hours of sleep, gotta get up, go to school, because I'm just, it's so connected and it's always going on and it's so distracting. It used to be viewers were predictable. They had their favorite couch or chair, and a TV. But as the world has become more connected, our devices now are mostly mobile, and that means our TVs are coming with us as phones, tablets, and computers. And we expect that content producers, including news organizations like Global, will be there. To that end, Global has launched an updated version of the Global TV app. 
becoming the first mainstream Canadian broadcaster in Canada to offer all its current shows and live news programming for free, while offering more channel options for cable subscribers. Our goal isn't to uh, just be the number one uh, source of the content that people watch, but to be able to put it in the kinds of places and kind of devices that they choose to watch it. It's that accessibility that consumers are demanding, even if their screen of choice is the smallest one in their home. It's just more relevant that you go on your phone. You come back from school, you come back from work. What do you do? You're tired, so you just go to your room. And you don't necessarily always go on your TV. There's no question streaming services like Netflix are extremely popular. Two-thirds of Canadians subscribe to at least one. Yet 59% of Canadians log onto their devices at least once per day to get their news. So the demand for Canadian content is there. Delivery has long been the issue. It's evolve or die, and it's find alternate sources of revenue or die. And, and news organizations certainly have, what they're hoping is that um, if they can deliver the, the signal for broadcasters in a new way that will get people to watch, whether it's on a smartphone or whether it's, a, whether it's over the top into, your, into a, 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 a flat screen monitor or a computer, then they'll be able to get people. The bottom line is Canadians still want content and are still invested in local and national news. They just no longer want to be anchored to their homes to get it. Microlight, Global News, Toronto. Hopefully they still want an anchor, though. That is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's here in Canada is Wolf Island Ferry near the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. Thanks for watching wherever you watch us and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.